live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2016. Brought to you by AWS and its ecosystem partners. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Back everyone, we are here live in Las Vegas for Amazon Web Services reInvent 2016. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We've got through the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host. This week's Stu Miniman, and our next guest is Teresa Carlson, Vice President of Worldwide Public Sector, booming business, CUBE alumni. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on again. Just, I love thoughts. you guys, thanks for having me back. Great to see you. So, obviously we see a lot of government, public sector action. Business is good, give us the update. How big is it growing? Can you share some stats? The business is doing really well. Um, I'm, very, I'm very proud of what our customers and partners are doing on AWS because generally in, a, in an environment where everybody thinks about it being really sort of stodgy and slow, it's actually moving really quickly. And in fact, here at, a, at the reInvent session, we had a closed door event just this morning with the intelligence community and we had a lot of people there, I'll just say that, and they are growing like crazy and yep. adopting the cloud, um, mission critical solutions, applications, workloads. So they're an example of, a, again, a group that everybody said, wow, the intelligence community, and they are moving fast. We had Department of Defense here, we've had intelligence agencies. We had the American Heart Association today where we just a couple weeks ago announced a precision medicine platform yep. with them. So it's going really well, and uh, I see that on a global basis. So while, again, people would say, yeah, commercial is moving really fast, government, education, not so, actually they're moving very fast. I want to get to the CIA update deal, but before that I had a chance to sit down with Andy Jassy uh, for a two hour exclusive interview at his house at the Helmet Head. He's got a, he's got a freaking sports bar in his basement, <laughs> so the best man cave of all time. Um, but we, we had a serious, long conversation. I wish I could have enjoyed uh, the sports bar more, even though the Seahawks game was on. <laughs> but I, I asked him about what he thought was really going to be big, both commercial and public sector. He talked about IoT, and behind us is C3 yeah. IoT, Tom Siebel's company, uh, quietly doing a lot of business, I hear, yeah. in public sector um, because of the data growth in IoT. Thoughts on the, um, how that IoT is shaping up in, in public sector? Oh, definitely. So if you think about vertical markets like justice and public safety, transportation, health, all those touch across every aspect of public sector, and IoT is really big in this business. In fact, um, I don't know if you know what CJIS is, but it's the Criminal Justice Information System. It's a mandate or compliance uh, that comes out of Department of Justice that states have to meet for, for justice and public safety data. Well, they are now, everybody almost is mandated for body cams. So if you think about body cams, there's lots of sensors now shaping up around just the body cam world of justice and public safety. Autonomous vehicles, transportation, Completely. you name it. Drones of every type, uh, video cams that are out there, sensors on uh, light poles everywhere, transportation, sensors everywhere. So it's very big and the data, you know, uh, by 2020 they think there's going to be over 30 billion data points coming from IOT devices, right? Well if you think about that, a lot of that's going to come out of a public sector space through smart city applications, um, citizens just touching and wanting to know every point and aspect from mapping, even um, if you go to places like Singapore, they have something called One Map, where every component of the city now has IOT sensors around where they look for where is traffic being amassed, where is a population gathering. So they're really looking at IoT even for capabilities like that. And because of AWS and serverless computing, right, it's very cheap and easy to use and these applications are quick to be built. Teresa, you've been traveling the globe and you must have a phenomenal viewpoint as to how things like security and compliance fit into people's thoughts about the cloud. Last time we talked to you, a lot about you know, things going on in the States, uh, yeah. you know, here, and we know that you know, the, the adoption here in the US. What, what, what do you see as the global view? How do they look at things like security and, and compliance globally? Well, I, I will tell you that they are still very concerned about it. In many countries, data sovereignty is still very on top of everyone's mind, but as you see, we're keeping pace with that because we're launching regions around the world. So when we launch a region, that's very good for the public sector business. 
because we can go into government in a partnership mode and immediately start doing their, their security and compliance. So we take in what we've learned from the U.S., but you might say, do, do global countries, other countries outside the U.S. really care about that? They do. They look at U.S. as a model because the U.S. was an early adopter of cloud. So we've taken the NIST standard, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, we've taken the FedRAMP model from U.S., and we literally share that, as well as other things like SOC 1 and SOC 2. So yes, they care, yes, they're concerned, but we have an answer in a model and Jumpstart programs to help them. So we are very hands-on, and we actually are like, what concern do you have? Let's address it head on. We do not back away from that stuff. We hit it head on. Yeah, when you look at the maturity of how customers are adopting things, you know, a lot of people start out kind of that base infrastructure service level and move up. Do you see that same kind of, does overseas, do they jump some of the maturity because cloud is more mature in general now or do they still go through some of those kind of basic crawl, walk, run? They, they still go through crawl, walk, run and it's, it's mainly because it's a, new, it's a new model. And we encourage that because we want them to have a well-architected design for anything, especially in mission critical applications. So from a well-architected uh, model, if you think about the workloads that they're driving, it's essential that they start and then they learn. Now, the really interesting thing is, once they get going, they just take off. So that crawl, walk, run, is very condensed. It's not the traditional model of IT. They move out fast. Teresa, what have you learned from the CIA deal? So you guys had a landmark win there. We talked about that on theCUBE when we last yeah. spoke a couple years ago. Um, and now you see with the VMware relationship, you're seeing them a hybrid coming together, where in essence, you're going to see Amazon being much more configurable to the needs of the environment that yes. might have legacy uh, constraints or environmental issues or <laughs> whatever their requirements yeah. are. It might not be a pure cloud native, it might be that hybrid. What have you learned from the CIA deal and how are you moving that into operations uh, as you go to market and, uh, and drive your business? Well, they, it's a great partnership, let me just say that. It's not really like a customer vendor relationship, it is a true partnership model. And as a result of that, we have really transformed the way government is adopting cloud. Very fast, very mission critical. We are learning together, and I'll tell you, one of the things we've learned is how to speed the accreditation of a system. And what I mean, the security and compliance, we move through that accreditation very fast. We've learned very uh, much on the AWS side, what, is the, what are the requirements that we need to meet at the, at the most sensitive side of data, and we've been able to move through those kind of things. Yep. That as well as new services that we uh, need to offer. And when you learn from a community like that, you have to remember, every time we do something from a community like that, we roll it into the rest of the world. So every customer of AWS. It's a lot of leverage there. Completely, so every customer gets to take advantage of the things that we're learning from great customers like the intelligence community. So one of the things on the stage this morning on the keynote was Vinra talking about cloud. And one My of the customer. I, yeah, exactly. I love Vinra. His comment that I want to get your thoughts on, because you mentioned security and stuff. He said security in the cloud is better than doing it on-prem, which has kind of been what Dave Vellante and I, and Dave in particular, have been talking about going back four years with Pat Gelsinger at VMworld. Is security a do-over? Is there new security models? And the big thing was multi-tenancy. And the right. debate, there's a variety of nuances around that debate. But I find it striking that he's standing on stage saying, this is what we've learned. Can you expand on, and, and expand that nuance? Because that, that, that seems to be now the thought process in the mind of folks who have a very secure security mindset that they want to have that, why are you guys doing this better than people can do it on, on their own? Well, the first thing that AWS did, and FINRA by the way, they are like amazing. They have moved out on the cloud and they are power users of the cloud. I just have to tell you, if you ever want anybody on to talk about, these guys are power users and they are moving their data and applications so fast and, and the way they've adopted and learned I think is quite innovative as well in terms of just getting their users on board with cloud, but why, if you, if you take a customer like that and, and they say AWS is more secure, why do they say that? Two reasons. One is we do not shy away from answering any question a customer brings up. So when you do that sort of arm waving and saying, oh, we can't go to cloud because it's not secure, we break it down item by item by item. We're like, okay, why? And we literally answer every question and check it off. 
And if we can't, we say, okay, let us go back. And we come back with an answer. So we love those. I mean, we yeah. love hard things to solve. Yeah. So for us, it's been like security is going to be the most important thing we have to deal with. So for the folks watching, go check out the replay of that keynote on day one. Uh, been a great, impressive uh, speaker. But the comment that Andy Jassy made as he was leaving the stage, kind of kind of read into the tea leaf there, connecting the dots. Andy said, thank you very much. I forget the guy's name. Um, thank you very much. On, We've yeah. learned a lot from you. And implying that they brought a lot to the table for AWS. Could you share things that they've brought to you guys? You said power user. What are they pushing you guys on? What are they doing to make you better? Well, the one thing, again, I think that differentiates the AWS model with customers, that obsession side of us, is we ask a lot of questions and we don't mind hard answers coming back to us. So when you have a customer like FINRA that deals with highly regulated data and industries, critical information that cannot fail because a market could fail, they push us and they're like, okay, this, like certain kinds of tools and technologies, they tell us if they need a different adaptation or tweaking and we listen to them and we work together. So when Andy says that, he's really talking about the model that AWS works with our customers, which is that give and take of what's working, what's not, how do we improve it? And our service teams, which is the beauty of cloud, you can, you can change that in real time. Like you don't wait much. You don't have to wait two years to cycle a feature or service. You're like, okay, let's, let's update that now. Let's make these tweaks and changes. And that's what cloud offers you, that experimentation, failing fast, recovering, and then moving out. To, Teresa, I, I'm curious how policy fits into you know, what you're working on. I heard the announcements this morning about AWS AI. You see, you see things like image recognition, uh, and you know, when you talk about the public sector, right. and you know, a lot of uncertainty going on in the global world, everything from Brexit to you know, what's happened in the US, and people are trying to, you know, <laughs> are, are regions going to be a little bit more insular with how they need to think about things? So how does Amazon approach this? How do you work locally and globally uh, on these kind of issues? Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. That's actually a great question. A lot of people do not realize how much, how important policy is yeah. and how it plays into a global company like AWS and our partner ecosystem. And what we do, we take a very proactive approach. We have a policy team around the world. And it was fairly new to us though at AWS. We didn't really have a tech policy team. So we've created that, but like everything else we do, we roll up our sleeves and we get in there. And I'll share my first trips to Capitol Hill almost six years ago. We would walk into congressional offices and they were like, oh, you're here to talk about Kindle or tax. We're like, no, we're here to talk about technology. And they would look at us because they had no idea what AWS is. Today they know what AWS is. And I love it because now we are shaping technology policy. We are explaining to them how the use of cloud is a differentiator for mission, how it creates jobs, how it um, creates companies. And we can go in and talk to a, you know, a minister of finance or a, a leader, a congressional leader on the House or Senate or whatever hill it is around the world and they get that AWS is a driver of jobs, which we don't talk about a lot, because when you think about startups and the number of startups that run on Amazon Web Services, that creates entrepreneurs, that creates jobs. And when we can talk to them about that, that helps us shape policy so they're not, so they don't think about policy in a way to inhibit innovation, but to create policy that drives innovation. And that drives jobs, so also brings up the point of uh, reshifting jobs, training thoughts on uh, how you guys are educating pre-existing job roles that are coming in, I mean with machine learning and you got Poly yeah. and you got Lex, the Alexa stuff, Echo, I mean all this new transformation, how are you guys re-educating the workforce? Well it's, if you ask me around the world, the number one thing I get asked about from ministers, prime ministers, CEOs, CIOs, they say how do I get jobs? How do I get these skills created? And what, here's what we're doing. So we created a program that we rolled out a year ago called AWS Educate. We announced the version two of this just a few weeks ago. And V2 is basically what we're doing. We crowdsource content. We give millions of dollars away to professors and students on computer science. So we encourage them to both create content for cloud, share that content, and then we help them curate it. We do hackathons on campus. We do online training and education, but what we've also added this year is a career pathway. 
And the career pathway gives these students badging so they can badge and select. If you go online, they can select their career on cloud. They can do like a security badging, an IoT badging. So we're going to allow them to have a, yeah. a badge they like. Now, the best thing about it, when they create their career pathway, they get the skills they need, they can put their resume on our job skills board. So we've created a board, they can, pl they can place their resume, and now we have all of our partner ecosystem putting their jobs up there. Salesforce, Amazon, AWS. We, yeah, we're just we're saying put all your cloud jobs that you have and select from these students that are now cloud-enabled workers. So we are yeah. really excited about the possibility of this program, and you're going to see us put a lot more into it this. It really combines the marketplace of ID, ideation ideas, ideation startups, innovation, that marketplace of ideas that we, we see that conversation happening with the marketplace of applicants. Yeah, exactly, and we have partners like Trend Micro wants to help us create that security badging. And I was just at the Peace Institute in Washington, D.C., and that's a who's who that comes to the Peace Institute from around the world. They want to create a peace badge for IT, and they even explained to me, which I had no idea, MIT and other universities have worked with them on an ethical model for peace IT. And so they want to create a badge with us for cloud. So these things, to me, it's just career after career, and we can get these students then connected on a global basis. Not just a US basis, but a global basis to actually um, get a new job. Now, can I just tell you one more thing about FINRA? Because I want you, they actually transitioned their workforce really interestingly. They gave out free credits. They said, here's credit card, go by cloud. And they let their IT workers go by cloud. And those workers that had a propensity toward, toward AWS and cloud, they started a whole new team with them. So think about it. They just allowed them on their own. That's like giving the keys to the candy yeah. store. and they just learned. So there's, there's like a lot of creative ways to get people to actually do a transition of skills. Well, we're really, really excited for you. It's great to watch you continue to have a great performance on the, the business side and the impact to society with what Thank you're doing. You. It's been fun to watch your, your team grow and you expand uh, the kingdom of public sector. Thank it's been you. a fun fun ride. What's next? What are we, what are we going to see this year from your group? What's, what's the big to-do item? What's the big mountain you, you're going to yeah. climb next? It, so the big thing you're going to see from us this year, we're going to have a big focus on the K through 12 side you're going to see a lot more coding academies. We're really going to try to focus on the education side on that really young uh, population. Uh, get, get them really excited about cloud. And I've hired a diversity expert, and you're going to see an, a big focus on women in tech and diversity in tech from my team. It's important. I mean, even if you still look at this conference, it's very yep. low on women. Well, we'll have to take our new nonprofit Tech Truth that we launched in July, and we kicked off at the Grace Hopper Women in Celebration, our first uh, class. Uh, integrated with some of the things you're doing, super exciting. I would love that. In fact, I'll invite you guys, we have our Women in Tech panel tomorrow, which we have uh, Girls Who Code, SVP as moderator. I'll be on the panel. We have a Netflix executive, we have a Salesforce executive, University of Maryland. And you're going to see us doing things around the world. And also, government worldwide, you're going to see us partnering with countries doing things with countries. We should be filming that live on, yeah, the, on the cube. We need like 10 cubes yeah, for Amazon yeah. reInvent too. I would love that because <laughs> countries, when you go into countries, they want you to partner with them. Yeah. So places outside, you know, they need to understand what does this cloud thing bring? And we've got to make sure that they understand it's a new way of doing business and it's a new way to create yeah. a, an economy. And the benefits of being agile, focus creativity on high impact That's right. opportunities. That's right. Congratulations, Teresa. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Teresa Carlson, Vice President of Worldwide Public Sector for Amazon Web Services, continuing to change society with technology and create more regions, more availability zones, all this stuff <laughs> that James Hamilton's building. All goodness for you guys, congratulations. We'll be right back with more live coverage here, live in Las Vegas at AWS Amazon Web Services reInvent 2016. I'm John Forrest, Do Miniman. We'll be right back with more live coverage after this break.